Welcome once again to the hour of the time. I'm William Cooper. Ladies and gentlemen, make sure that you stay glued to your radio tonight as we bring you another in the never-ending series that we call Mystery Babylon. Tonight's episode, ladies and gentlemen, is entitled Darkness. There is no study so intriguing and yet so mysterious as that of the early religions of mankind. To trace back the worship of God to its simple origin and to mark the gradual process of those degrading superstitions and hollowed rites which darkened and finally extinguished his presence in the ancient world. At first, men enjoyed the blessings of nature as children do in an age of innocence without inquiring into causes. It was, in fact, sufficient for them that the earth gave them herbs, that the trees bore them fruit, that the stream quenched their thirst. They were happy, and every moment, though unconsciously, they offered a prayer of gratitude to him whom as yet they did not know. And then a system of theology arose amongst them vague and indefinite as the waters of the boundless sea. They taught each other that the sun, the earth, the moon, and the stars were moved and illumined by a great soul which was the source of all life, which caused the birds to sing, the brooks to murmur, and the sea to heave. It was a sacred fire which shone in the firmament, and in mighty flames it was a strange being which animated the souls of men, and which, when the bodies died, returned unto itself again. Ancient man silently adored this great soul in the beginning and spoke of him with reverence. And sometimes they raised their eyes timidly to his glittering dwelling place on high. And soon they learned to pray. When those whom they loved lay dying, they uttered wild lamentations and flung their arms despairingly toward the mysterious soul. For in times of trouble, the human mind, so imbecile, so helpless, always clings back to something that is much stronger than itself. As yet, in that time, they worshipped only the sun, the moon, and the stars. And not as gods, but as visions of that divine essence which alone ruled and pervaded the earth, the sky, 
and the sea. They adored him kneeling with their hands clasped and their eyes raised. They offered him no sacrifices. They built him no temples. You see, they were content to offer him their hearts, which were full of awe, in his own temple, which was full of the grandeur of nature. For the God they worshipped was indeed nature's God. And it is said by some that there are yet some barbarous islands where men have no churches nor ceremonies and where they still worship God, reflected in the work of his uncountable hands. And the mystery and the balance and the perfection of nature. But you see, they were not long content with this simple service. There were those amongst them who learned how to subvert and twist so that they could control the others around them. Prayer, which had first been an inspiration, suddenly fell into a system and men already grown wicked prayed the deity to give them abundance of wild beast skins and to destroy their enemies. They ascended eminences, mountain tops, and they built towers as if hoping that thus their being near God, he would prefer their prayers to those of their rivals. Those who controlled those eminences became powerful. And such is the origin of that superstitious reverence for high places which was universal throughout the whole, the entire heathen world. And then, it is clear in the ancient annals that someone came forth. Orpheus was born. And he invented instruments which to his touch and to his lips gave forth notes of surpassing sweetness and with these melodies he enticed the wandering, innocent savages into the recesses of the forest. And there, there, Orpheus taught them precepts of obedience to the great soul and of loving kindness toward each other in harmonious words. And he became the high priest. And so they devoted groves and forests to the worship of the deity. There were men who had watched Orpheus and who had seen and envied his power over the herd who surrounded him. For even then there were sheeple. They resolved to imitate him, and having studied these barbarians, they banded together and called themselves their priests. Religion is divine, but its ministers, after all, are men the idea from the beginning that imperfect men could rule imperfect men is flawed. For alas, sometimes they are demons with the faces and wings of angels. 
say the simplicity of men and the cunning of their priests has destroyed or corrupted all the religions of the world, bar none. For these priests, ladies and gentlemen, taught the people to sacrifice the choicest herbs and flowers. They taught them formulas of prayer and bade them make so many obeisances to the sun and to worship those flowers which opened their leaves when he rose and which closed them as he set for that great ball of fire that makes its way from dawn to dusk across the sky was seen as the savior to those who huddled in the cold darkness surrounded by wild beasts of prey and it was to that sun that they directed their worship as the great symbol in the heaven of the power of God and the source of all life on this earth. For remember, theirs was the worship of nature's God. They composed a language of symbols, which was perhaps necessary in those times since letters had not been invented but which perplexed the people and perverted them from the worship of the one God those symbols are still used upon the sheeple of the world today the great herd thus the Sun represented the great doctrine of this religion. The moon represented the church reflecting the pure light of the sun. And the sun and the moon were worshipped as emblems of God. And fire, by the philosophers of fire, as an emblem of the sun. Water, as an emblem of the moon which by faith reflected the pure light of its master. The serpent represented the full body of the priesthood, the initiates, and was to be worshipped as an emblem of wisdom and eternal youth, since it renews its skin every year. Thus, it periodically casts off all symptoms of old age and begins anew. Reborn, if you will. And the bull, the most vigorous of animals and whose horns resembled those of the crescent moon, was also worshipped. The priests observed the avidity with which the barbarians adored these symbols and increased them. It was a time of great mystery and little understanding of any that was seen around them. To ancient man, the sun was seen to die, and darkness descended around them. It was a time of great danger and cold. And then, as if by magic the sun was reborn each morning and made its way across the sky where it became old and then died again and they began to measure their world by the seasons of the sun and their religion reflected all of this and religions today, even though denying any connection with this ancient paganism, still reflects this exact religion in its ceremonies and in its holy days. Even to the layout of its churches. To worship the visible is a disease of the soul inherent to all mankind, 
and the disease which these men could have healed, instead they pandered to. It is true that the first generation of men might have looked upon these merely as the empty symbols of a divine being, but it is also certain that in time the vulgar forgot the god in the emblem and worshipped that which their fathers had only honored, and therefore the symbol became the god. Egypt was the fountainhead of these idolatries, and it was in Egypt that the priests first applied real attributes to the sun and to the moon, whom they called his wife, and sister and mother. The sun became Osiris, the moon became Isis, brother and sister, mother and son, husband and wife, It may, it may perhaps, for those of you who have not heard it, maybe have not been listening to this broadcast for a great period of time, it may perhaps interest you to listen to the first, the very first fable of the world. From the midst of chaos, was born Nimrod, and at his birth a voice was heard proclaiming, The ruler of all the earth is born. And from the same dark and troubled womb were born Semiramis, the queen of light, and the spirit of darkness. This Nimrod traveled over the whole world and civilized its inhabitants and taught them the art of agriculture. And his wife, Semiramis, built the first fortified cities and walls. But on his return, the jealous darkness laid a stratagem for him, and in the midst of a banquet had him slain. He was nailed down in his prison, which cast into the river, floated into the sea, which even in that ancient time was never mentioned but with marks of detestation. And when Semiramis learned these sad news, she cut off a lock of her hair and put it on her mourning robes and wandered through the whole country in search of the dead body of her husband. Eventually, she found it. By casting a magic spell, a magical intercourse was obtained between Semiramis and the dead Nimrod, from which a child emerged. The child was Tammuz. And Semiramis fed the infant with her finger instead of with her breast and put him every night into fire to render him immortal. And now, let me read you a later story of the same myth, only with different names. And I have to depart from my narration here and read this to you. From the midst of chaos was born Osiris. And at his birth, a voice was heard proclaiming, The ruler of all the earth is born. And from the same dark and troubled womb were born Isis, the queen of light, and Typhon, the spirit of darkness. 
This Osiris moved over the whole world and civilized its inhabitants and taught them the art of agriculture, brought them together in societies for their mutual benefit and protection. But on his return to Egypt, the jealous Typhon laid a stratagem for him and in the midst of a banquet had him shut up in a chest which exactly fitted his body. He was nailed down in his prison which cast into the Nile, floated down to the sea by the Ta'idic mouth, which even in the time of Plutarch was never mentioned by an Egyptian except with disdain and loathing. When Isis heard the news, she cut off a lock of her hair and put on her mourning robes and wandered through the whole country in search of the chest which contained the dead body of her husband. At length she learnt that the chest had been carried by the waves to the shore of Byblos and had there lodged in the branches of a tamarisk bush, which quickly shot up and became a large and beautiful tree growing round the chest so that it could not be seen. The king of the country, amazed at the vast size the tree had so speedily acquired, ordered it to be cut down, to be hewn into a pillar to support the roof of his palace, the chest being still concealed in the trunk. The voice which had spoken from heaven at the birth of Osiris made known these things to poor Isis, who then went to the shore of Byblos and sat down silently by a fountain to weep. The damsels of the queen met her and accosted her, and the queen appointed her to be nurse to her child. And Isis fed the infant with her finger instead of with her breast, and put him every night into fire to render him immortal. While transforming herself into a swallow, she hovered around the pillar which was her husband's tomb, and bemoaned her unhappy fate. It happened that the queen thus discovered her and shrieked when she saw her child surrounded by flames. And by that cry she broke the charm and deprived him of immortality. By that cry, Isis was summoned back to her goddess form and stood before the awestruck queen, shining with light and diffusing sweet fragrances around. She cut open the pillar and took the coffin with her and opened it in a desert. There she embraced the cold corpse of Osiris and wept bitterly. Isis returned to Egypt and hid the coffin in a remote place, but Typhon, hunting by moonlight, chanced to find it and divided the corpse into fourteen pieces. Again Isis set out on her weary search throughout the whole land sailing over the finny parts in a boat made of papyrus. She recovered all the fragments except one which had been thrown into the sea. Each of these she buried in the place where she found it, which explains why in Egypt there are so many tombs of Osiris. And instead of the limb which was lost, she gave the phallus to the Egyptians, the disgusting worship of which was thence carried into Italy, into Greece, and into all the countries of the East. And today, people pay obeisance to this phallus when they stand in awe of the Washington Monument, or when they attend spike training, for truly, <laughs> for truly, it is the shaft. When Isis died, she was buried in a grove near Memphis, over her grave was raised a statue covered from head to foot with a black veil, and underneath was engraved these divine words, quote, I am all that has been, that is, that shall be, and none among mortals has yet dared to raise my veil, end quote. Beneath this veil, ladies and gentlemen, are concealed all the mysteries and learning of the past. A young scholar, his fingers covered with the dust of venerable folios, his eyes weary and reddened by nightly toil, will now attempt to lift a corner of this mysterious and sacred covering. The 
folios or the old books that I had discovered in used bookstores across the country and around the world. And truly, in some of those dark and dim corners and shelves that have never been touched, I have been literally covered with the dust of years that has settled upon these ancient volumes. Those that I could afford have found their way into my library, where they still serve today. You see, these two deities, Isis and Osiris, were the parents of all the gods and goddesses of the heathens, or were indeed those gods themselves worshipped under many different names. Nimrod, Semiramis, Isis, Osiris, Diana, and Dionysus. The fable itself was received into the mythologies of the Hindus and the Romans. Sira is said to have mutilated the Brahma as Typhon did Osiris, and Venus to have lamented her slain Adonis as Isis wept for her husband, God, brother, son. And as yet, the sun and moon alone were worshipped under these two names. And as we have seen, besides these twin beneficial spirits, men who had begun to recognize sin in their hearts had created an evil one who struggled with the power of light and fought with them for the soul's of men. I must tell you that in my studies I find that it has been natural through all history for man to fabricate something that is worse than himself rather than take the responsibility upon his own shoulders. And even in the theology of the American Indians, which is the purest of the modern world, there is found a mahitu, or dark spirit. Osiris, or the sun, was now worshipped throughout the whole world, though under different names. He was the Mithra of the Persians, the Brahma of India, the Baal, or Adonis of the Phoenicians. He was the Apollo of the Greeks the Odin of Scandinavia, the Hugh of the Britons, and the byway of the Laplanders. Isis, ladies and gentlemen, also received the name of Islene, Ceres, Rhea, Venus, Vesta, Subo, Niobe, Melissa, Nehalenia, in the north. Isi with the Indians, Puza among the Chinese, and Seridwin among the ancient Britons. The Egyptians were sublime philosophers who had dictated theology to the world. And in Chaldea arose the first astrologers who watched the heavenly bodies with curiosity as well as with all, and who made divine discoveries, and who called themselves the interpreters of God. And to each star they gave a name, and to each day in the year they gave a star. And the Greeks and Romans, who were poets, wreathed these names into legends. Each name was a person. And each person was a god. From these stories of the stars originated the angels of the Jews, the genie of the Arabs, the heroes of the Greeks, and the saints of the Ramish church. And then, corruption grew upon corruption and superstition, flung black and hideous veil over the doctrines of religion. 
You see, a religion, ladies and gentlemen, is lost, utterly lost as soon as it loses its simplicity. Truth has no mysteries. It is deceit alone that lurks in obscurity. It is only the lie that is hidden behind a door. Men multiplied God into a thousand names and created him always in their own image. Him, too, whom they had once deemed unworthy of any temple less noble than the floor of the earth and the vast dome of the sky which he had created, they worshipped in caves and then in temples which were made of the trunks of trees, rudely sculptured and ranged in rows to imitate groves of trees, and with other trunks placed upon them traversely to form the cross that is seen when you hold up your son behind some obstacle. They streak across the sky. These were the first buildings of worship erected by man from no reverence for the deity, for God, but only to display that which they conceived to be a stupendous effort in art and to display their knowledge and power so as to more adequately rule and subjugate the herd, the sheeple, the profane humanity that had not a clue, and still doesn't, by the way. It may be necessary to remind some of you that a superior being God, if you will, must view the elegant temples of the Romans, the gorgeous pagodas of India, and the Gothic cathedrals of the Western world with feelings similar to those with which we might contemplate the rude efforts of the early heathens or a hill of ants who deemed God unworthy of the fruits and flowers which he himself had made and offered to him the entrails of beasts and the hearts of human beings. Can you imagine the audacity, the arrogance of such a thing? We can compare, ladies and gentlemen, an ancient and fallen religion to the ship of the Argonauts, which the Greeks, desiring to preserve to posterity, repairing in so many different ways, that at length there did not remain a fragment of the original vessel which had borne to Colchis the conqueror of the Golden Fleece. So let's pass over a lapse of many, many years, centuries, if you will, and then contemplate the condition of the nations in whom religion had been first born. We find the Egyptians adoring the most common of plants, the most contemptible of beasts, the most hideous of reptiles, The solemnity and pomp of their absurd ceremonies held them up to the ridicule of the whole wide world. Clemens of Alexandria describes one of their temples thusly, quote, The walls shine with gold and silver and with amber and sparkle with the gems of India and Ethiopia, and the recesses are concealed by splendid curtains. But if you enter the penetralia and inquire for the image of God for whose sake the fame was built, one of the pastophori or some other attendant on the temple approaches with a solemn and mysterious face and putting aside the veil suffers you to obtain a glimpse of the divinity 
And there, upon an altar, you behold a snake, or a crocodile, or a cat, or some other beast, a fitter inhabitant of a cavern, or a bog than of a temple, or a giant penis, the phallus of Osiris, which Isis had substituted upon the altar of Egypt. The priests of Egypt were always impostors, but once so celebrated, had degenerated into a race of jugglers, a circus, if you will. Also, the Chaldeans lived upon the fame of their fathers and upon their own base trickeries. No one was honest anymore. No one could point to God. No one understood that all the symbols of the universe and nature represented the power of an unseen God. that the first men worshipped, the Brahmins or Brahmins whose priests of India once so virtuous and celebrated as being so wise, they too had fallen. Once they had forbidden the shedding of so much as an insect's blood. One day in the year alone, at the feast of Jagam, they were authorized to sacrifice the flesh of a beast and from this, many had refrained from attending, unable to conquer their feelings of abhorrence. But now, they had learnt from the fierce Scythians and from the Phoenicians who traded on their coast to sacrifice the wife upon her husband's pair to appease the gentle Brahma with the blood of men, and that ceremony continues to this day. The angels who had presided over them became savage demons who scourged them on to cruel penances, even to lifetimes of suffering and famine. And in the sacred groves where once the Brahmin fathers had taught their precepts of love, men emaciated, careworn, even dying, wondered sadly waiting for death as tortured prisoners wait for their liberty. But worse still, these wicked priests sought through the land for the most beautiful young women and trained them to dance in the temples and to entice the devotees to their arms with lustful attitudes and languishing looks and with their voices which mingled harmoniously with the golden bells suspended on their feet, they became prostitutes for the priesthood. They sang hymns to the gods in public and in private, enriched the treasuries of the pagoda with their infamous earnings. And thus a pure, very simple religion was debased by the avarice and lewdness of its priests. So the temples became a den of thieves. So prostitution sat enthroned upon the altars of the gods, and today it continues, although prostitution in a different way. Most religious meetings today are spiritual consumerism. Begins with the problem, and when the hour is over, the problem has been solved, and the coffers of the priest, the minister, have been filled in the process. Greece and Rome, buried in sloth and luxury, did not escape the general contamination. The emblem of generation, the phallus which Isis had bestowed upon the Egyptians, which they had held in abstract reverence, had now obtained a prominent place in the festivals of these nations as did the lingam and those of the Hindus. And it was openly paraded in possessions before guests in the home, in processions in the streets. It was worn by Roman nations in bracelets upon their arms. It adorns our nation's capital as the Washington Monument and stands mocking us in Dealey Plaza in Dallas, Texas. The sacred 
festivals and mysteries which they had received from the Egyptians and for which the women had been wont to prepare themselves by continence and the men by fasting were now their vehicles for all the depravities and deceptions of the very lowest kind. Men were permitted to join the women in the worship of Bacchus or Adonis of the Bonadia and even of Priapus. And so dissolute did the Dionysia become, ladies and gentlemen, that the civil powers were compelled, yea, forced to interfere with those of religion and the Bacchanalia were abolished by a decree of the Roman Senate. But it was too late, for Rome's fate had been sealed. And the Jews, the chosen people of God, had not their religion changed? Had not God, weary with their sins, yielded them to captivity, scourged them with sorrow, menaced them with curses, and isn't the state of Israel more a secular state than a religious state today, despite the claims of Zionism? They worshipped Baal, Peor, the Priapus of Assyria. They sacrificed their children to Moloch. They had dancing girls in the Holy Temple. This corruption spared no race, no people, no religion, and no one can point to any other and say truthfully that they are more guilty than they. For all are guilty. All people, all religions, all nations, all over this world destroyed the simple precepts of all of the different religions of the world and none resemble even slightly what they began to be. And I'm not going to go deeper into particulars that are so degrading to human nature. I can see you squirming on your seats as it is. I will have mercy. I will instead invite you to follow me by steadily listening to the hour of the time to a corner where you may begin to more readily understand where we are at and where we are going, for there are many who have traveled this route before in the history of the world. It is enacted in cycles, and those who ignore history are doomed to repeat it. There is a place in the world where at least for many ages religion was preserved in its pristine purity and whose priests, through a barbarous soldiery, were received as martyrs, they claim, in heaven before they had even learned to be names upon this earth. It was an isolated spot unknown to the world in the earlier ages of vice, is now a kingdom renowned for its once great power that encircled the globe and for its luxuries from hemisphere to hemisphere and for its civilizing influence and also its abject cruelty. It was encircled by the blue waters of the German and Atlantic seas and abounded in the choicest gifts of nature. It was called the White Island from the cliffs which still frowned so coldly upon Gaul and the land of green hills from its verdant mountains. 
There was a song during World War II called The White Cliffs of Dover. And subsequent broadcasts, and they may not be coming soon, I will take you to that land and I will show you its priests in their white robes and its warriors in the blue paint of war and its virgins with their long and glossy yellow hair. And I will tell you the truth of the ancient religion of Britain and it has absolutely nothing to do with any lost tribe of Israel. We will begin that journey some some propitious evening where I will lead you back into the past and relate to you why this land was called Albion and why Britain. Good night, ladies and gentlemen. And God bless each and every single one of you.